the topic of my talk this evening is really quite appropriate for Gresham because the very first professor of astronomy at uh, Gresham College was a man called Edward Brailwood, very little known today. Uh, and perhaps that's because, um, according to his uh, notice here, he loved retirement <laughs> and wholly devoted himself to the pursuit of knowledge. And though he never published anything himself, yet he was very communicative, rather strange. Um, it's not entirely true that he never published anything himself, because um, I have here a, a slim volume uh, written by said Edward Browood, which is in Latin, of course, De Ponderibus, etc., etc. So it's a tract on weights, measures, and coins of the ancient civilizations, Roman and, and Greek civilizations. Uh, and it's actually called, uh, a slim volume though it is, it's actually called Liber Unus, the first volume. Uh, to the fir the, nothing more. No second volumes are, are known, and it's most unlikely there ever were any, because this is dated 1614, and uh, Mr. Brailwood uh, apparently died in 1613. So, um, <coughs> my own slim volume um, is uh, uh, here, and what I'm going to do <coughs> is to tell you a story in three parts, um, which are selected highlights, if you like, uh, of the story of mathematics, measurement, and money down about 5,000 years. And so we'll begin 5,000 years ago. We'll then skip a vast number of thousands of years till the uh, early modern period when there was a really a new beginning of mathematics. And then we'll look at one or two of the problems uh, that face us today and how these topics, mathematics, measurement, and money, are very much linked with the global problems that we face in the 21st century. So, always begin at the beginning. So, the place to begin is, well, there were several places where we might begin, but we're beginning in Mesopotamia, because the Mesopotamians had the good luck to possess uh, a means of recording what they were doing by writing on clay tablets. When they wrote on them, they wrote on them with a kind of stylus, and the, uh, the tablets were soft. But when the tablets went hard, they are almost indestructible. And so we can see what they were doing. And here is a, a, a typical tablet. Um, I'm not going to pretend to tell you I can decipher anything that's on there, but there are people who know, and they can and do, and they can pick out certain signs. And from our point of view, the most important thing is that some of the signs are quite clearly numerical. That is, uh, here is some kind of object, the one on the left, uh, and uh, they look as if there are probably eight baskets of it. So it might be baskets of grain, but don't quote me on that. Uh, and the thing on the right, uh, God knows what that is, but uh, quite clearly there was only one of them. Perhaps it was a large animal or something like that that, that was, was on the farm. So you find these things in the, um, on the tablets from around 3000 BC when large settlements, cities may be the wrong word to call them, but large settlements were formed and there were people who would involved directly in the agrarian economy, farmers and so forth, but there were people doing other kinds of jobs as well. And this sort of interaction led to the need for measurements and money, as we shall see. So, uh, skipping rather quickly ahead to get through 5,000 years, uh, within the next 1,000 years or so, the Mesopotamians, I'm not going into details as to which particular culture we're talking about, I'll just call them all Mesopotamians. Um, the Mesopotamians had decided that it would be a good idea to have a more systematic way of recording numerical information, and they had <coughs> worked out in their cuneiform script, as it's called, 
uh, this method of recording numbers. So you have a number for 10, a sign for 10, and a sign for 1. <coughs> and you combine them in ways which people were expected, or people who were going to use these numbers were expected to know. So you put uh, a 10 and 7 of those 1 signs, and that counted for 17. And then for bigger numbers, you put, uh, you group together uh, things in 60s in this case. They chose the number 60 because that's a number which is very good because it is divisible by all the numbers 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Uh, and so uh, the thing on the right there is stands for four lots of 60 and the 17 that we had before, what we should call 257. This was a great advance and was the beginning of the ability to do what we would call arithmetic, that is, to do operations with these numbers, not just count with them. So, what sort of things did they want to do operations with? Well, again, we'll stick with the farming side of things. There were several possibilities, but farming was obviously the basic primary activity, and that inevitably led to certain simple questions. I have a field. How big is my field? If I want to divide it between two of my descendants equally, how am I going to do that? We'll stick with the first question. How big is this field? Now, even this is a rather idealised field. It has four sides, but they're straight lines. Uh, and let's think about the ways in which um, people might have, in very primitive societies, uh, tried to measure this field. Well, basic one, of course, the first one would be just count in some way. Well, what, what are you going to count? Well, here the, the practice, of course, tells you what to do, because if you're tending this field, you plough it, and you plough in a strip. So you might count the number of strips, the number of ups and downs, and when you're ploughing. Then you might move on a little bit, and if you have worked out how to measure the length of an item, you might decide, well, uh, we'll measure the length of each strip and add them up. So that's now arithmetic. We've moved on from the simple numbers into the counting, and <coughs> sorry, from the counting into the addition, an arithmetical operation, and we're going to need methods, rules, for doing that, with our numerical symbols. A bit further on, another way of thinking about the size of the field is to try and measure what we would measure it in terms of what we would now call the area. In other words, divide it up into little squares, uh, and this is a rather small field, a small holding or something, um, but uh, uh, we can work out, uh, and I've used modern terminology, of course, uh, well, we can actually work out that there are 28 of these little squares, whatever notation we're using, and 7 times 4 is 28. So here is the idea of multiplication, the next important mathematical operation, arithmetical operation, has now come into play. And of course, <coughs> that's really not particularly helpful in real terms, because your fields were rarely of this nice rectangular shape. And this is where real people whom we should recognize as mathematicians, although we don't know their names or anything about them, this is all happening before 2000 BC, where real mathematicians started to get their teeth into problems. And so what's the size of a triangle in our field? Um, I suppose that was the size of our field. And here, probably, I would guess, a lot of people in a lot of different cultures, not just in Mesopotamia, worked this out for themselves. And these were probably the first recognisable mathematicians. And they worked out that how to find the area of a triangle by these imaginary operations. Take the triangle. <coughs> Here's our triangle. Uh, take another triangle of the same size and stick them together, and then do a bit of fudging 
the ends like that, and you've got a rectangle. And what's more, <coughs> so we know how to do a rectangle, that, that's multiplication, uh, and we can see that in order to measure the size of the triangle, we've got to multiply what would be called the base of the triangle by the other side of the rectangle, which is the height of the triangle. So <coughs> with this, of course, uh, we are really on the way as far as mathematics is concerned. And th this is one of the most useful rules in the whole of elementary mathematics. And we've leapt, or I've leapt forward, uh, to uh, only a couple of hundred years ago. This idea, so this is from a textbook published, it's actually called Cullier's Gentleman's and Farmer's Assistant. And uh, here is how you would measure the size of the field in about 1810 or 1815 when the book was published. Uh, and you will see that it's essentially the rule that I have just shown you. Uh, except that, uh, well, it is the rule. At the end, at the bottom, you're doing some multiplications. But notice that the gentleman and farmer was actually above doing the actual calculations himself. The reason why it's laid out like that whatever it is, so many yards long uh, and the width broken down into 110 and 5 is because this was a book of tables and in the tables you could look up what 200 and so many yards with a hundred times 100 yards wide would make in the queer units that were used at that time. The, these are, uh, some of us will remember these things from our school days, that these are acres, roods and perches, I think. And uh, some of us had to suffer by learning the rules for acres, rules, roods, and perches. But I have, fortunately, one of the many things that I have forgotten. That was the input, if you like, to the agricultural process, the field for where the grain is grown. The output is the grain. And what are you going to do with the grain? Well, of course, the point of Agriculture is that you make things and then they're going to be used gradually. Uh, make them in the summer and they're used in the winter, so you've got to store them. And there are tablets which indicate that the Mesopotamians stored their grain in pits and they pit, the pits had a standard size. Uh, I've gone back to using their units here. So a rod was about five or six meters uh, and a cubit was about half a meter. So you would store your grain in the pit and possibly cover it over for the winter and then it was available to be shared out. And to share it out <coughs> you're going to use a smaller vessel. So these units are what are called fingers <coughs> and so on the left uh, the simplest uh, way of sharing it out would be to use a cuboid sort of uh, vessel, uh, five, uh, no, six by six at the base uh, and five fingers high. And that was, we know from the tablets, a standard measure around 2000 BC. So all well and good, but uh, making a cuboidal measure is actually a bit of a mess. Uh, you've got to fix things together in a rather complicated way and make sure the angles are right and so forth. Another way of making a container is to make it cylindrical, <clears throat> like the one on the right. And suppose we make it cylindrical with the same sort of base as the square one there, in other words, a circle of diameter six, then the question naturally arises, how tall should this cylinder be, how tall should this vessel be, in order that it should actually contain the same amount as the cuboidal one. Now, we must clear our minds of anything to do with the number pi. Uh, th this was not the way it was worked out, but nevertheless, they had a rule. And if we want to examine their rule, then nowadays everybody would say it was equivalent to taking pi to be equal to three. This is quite clear. And pi equal to 3 is the earliest approximation. It occurs in the Bible, for instance, but this is considerably earlier than that. So um, here we have 
seen already in the first so many thousand years, well, about a thousand years, <coughs> the elements of mathematics and how it began, how measurement was closely interlinked with the development of the mathematical operations, the need for doing the mathematical operations in order to solve the measuring problems. And to signal the end of the beginning, if you like, um, this is a tablet from about 1850 BC. Uh, again, it is just a typical tablet, but you can see here it is written in this cuneiform script, and there are lots of things on it, and don't ask me what it says because I can't read cuneiform, but the good thing about cuneiform was that people could, people now can read it. It has been deciphered, and so there are lots and lots of these tablets, and far too many of them for uh, people currently working in this field, even to think of reading all of them, and that, so there are quite likely interesting mathematical discoveries to be made in this field when we have enough people and enough time to read the tablets. One thing that we need to notice about the tablets is <clears throat> that a lot of the operations, a lot of the information and operations relates to what uh, <clears throat> we now call money. And this is related also to the other theme of measurement. So uh, a, a tablet like this um, could contain, and there are many that do, things which relate to, first of all, the buying and selling of commodities. And money in this period uh, was not to be thought of as we think of it today, but could be two main forms, well, several, but anyway, let's say, let's focus on two. One was uh, lumps of silver. By this time, people had managed to mine silver, and there was quite a bit of it about, but not many people had silver. What most people had was grain, because they were farmers. And so uh, grain was used as a means of payment for the workers, as a means of exchange, that you could buy a new animal, if you like, with a certain amount of grain and things like that. But most importantly, for those who are interested in the history of money, uh, and I, I'm not an economist, I have to say, so um, <clears throat> I'm not going to give you a first year lecture on what is money. Um, in any case, economists now sidestep this issue and say money is as money does. And in this case, what it did, what it did <coughs> was uh, actually to provide a measure <coughs> of social interaction. The prince or the ruler, Hammurabi is a name that springs to mind, could say, I want you to be well-behaved people, and if you do something that's illegal, you will have to pay a fine. So we find tablets which tell you how much you're going to have to pay for slapping a man's face. And they tell you the amount in baskets of grain, or in so much weight of silver. So we have two kinds of money at least, the grain and the silver there, and that's a theme we're going to return to in the rest of the talk. Okay, so let's skip 3,000 years or so. <coughs> and what happened in that time was, of course, that civilization, complexity of life, increased dramatically. Uh, trade was no longer a local phenomenon. Trade, international trade, by the time we're beginning to think about um, what I put here on the screen are some coins from uh, the period 1100 to 1300. Uh, so in order to facilitate this, people had done rather better than just having to use lumps of silver or baskets of grain for their trading. They had invented the idea of coins. And in particular here, I've shown you <coughs> some gold coins. Uh, these ones 
uh, come from various places. The first one is of Islamic origin, I think. Yes, there it is. <coughs> Islamic origin. The next one is from Spain, bordering the Islamic regions because the uh, Islamic Empire had expanded into Spain at this time. Then we have one from Sicily, which again was on the borders of the Islamic Empire, but this one from Sicily harking back to the Roman style. It looks rather like a Roman emperor, which Frederick II of Sicily rather liked to uh, think of himself as. And then finally, for purposes of trade, in Florence by about 1250, um, the idea uh, had taken such a hold that the Florentines started to produce what became the standard gold coin of the Middle Ages, the late Middle Ages, the Florentine florin. The thing to notice about these coins, they, these are obviously much more convenient than lugging around baskets of uh, um, uh, grain, but um, although they look pretty similar there, they're in fact quite different. In other words, they're different in size, they're different in weight, which would be the way you would check them, but they're different in another subtle way as well. They're, they're different in the purity of the gold that they contain. So <clears throat> I don't know the exact figures, but there are books, manuscripts from this time, which go into great lengths to tell you what, they, what the fineness is, the percentage of pure gold in these gold coins was. And that, of course, is just one instance of the amazing complication of arithmetic in particular, which had to be dealt with by the time we're talking about, the new beginning of mathematics. This is a little before the new beginning. The Renaissance, of course, uh, much talked about by the arty types, really doesn't, uh, uh, Renaissance by which I would date around 1500, shall we say, that didn't really affect mathematics too greatly. Mathematics was trundling along quite, um, quite normally at that time, but no great breakthroughs. The new beginning of mathematics came towards the end of the 16th century and the beginning of the 17th century. And so here we have <coughs> a marker, if you like, for what was going on. A printed book now, or printed on paper, all these things are relevant to how the story develops. Uh, and of course, you can read them, <coughs> read more about them in the transcript of my talk, which will be given out uh, at the end of the talk. But here we have um, how people were doing a particular kind of arithmetic, adding up fractions, in 1633. And you'll notice several things. First of all, the symbols for numbers are now the Hindu-Arabic arithmetic, the Hindu-Arabic symbols, which had gradually evolved over the previous thousand years or so into the form which they are printed here, and which is the form that we still use today. They're in, it's instantly recognisable what is going on there. The other thing to notice is that the rule is simply stated there. In other words, we're trying to add up uh, what's it, two thirds and three quarters, uh, and we are told to multiply the denominators and get 12, uh, and then do something else uh, uh, and get the answer. It's stated in words. It could have been stated as an algebraic formula, but it wasn't in this book. Um, it is what we would call an algorithm, or a set of rules carried out in a um, given order which will lead to the correct result, whatever your fractions are. Uh, just very quickly, and I'm not going to dwell on this, <coughs> but the use of the Hindu-Arabic numerals and decimal notation facilitated the introduction of logarithms, which many of us, of course, learned an awful lot about at school. Uh, and uh, um, in order to um, use logarithms for the kinds of calculation that were now being done, particularly in the natural sciences, in astronomy and navigation, they needed logarithms to a great degree of accuracy. I think there's about 30 places of decimals there 
for each um, <coughs> uh, logarithm. More to the point, from the point of view of the growth of the mathematics itself, it is the new idea which is introduced on this slide. So <clears throat> this is from a manuscript. I've transcribed it <coughs> uh, so that it's a bit easier to see what's going on. Uh, Thomas Harriot, uh, uh, a famous mathematician who did an awful lot of mathematics but didn't publish any of it in his lifetime. Uh, and uh, this is a particular um, problem that we don't really know why he did this, but it's about compound interest. For those who <coughs> want to read more, again, it's in the transcript. It's actually about continuous compounding of compound interest. And from the mathematical point of view, it's interesting because it has the idea of infinite series and limits thereof. But what hits you in the face is the fact that in this manuscript, in various places, uh, he is using symbolic notation, these 7n minus 2s and things like that. So not just arithmetical symbols, but algebraical symbols as well. Now, algebra was not new. Algebra had been invented, if that's the right word, by the Islamic civilization around 800 to 900 AD. But it had taken an awful long time to get going, and that was because what we now call algebra, which is basically, to distinguish it, I'll call it symbolic algebra. Symbolic algebra didn't really take off until the end of the 16th century. And Harriet was, in fact, one of the first to use it in anger. And with this symbolic algebra, he, he was able to work out, he's actually using the binomial theorem here. Uh, and um, with that, <coughs> he was able to work out that the result of continuous compounding, although <coughs> the frequency of compounding increases the yield, keeping the equivalent rate the same, it does not increase it beyond bounds. In other words, there is a limit. So, uh, this symbolic algebra was really the key to the, <coughs> not the Renaissance, but a completely new beginning in mathematics. Because very soon after this, um, Descartes, for example, uh, saw how to deploy symbolic algebra in geometry, a classical um, part of mathematics, which had started back with the Babylonians when I showed you the area of the triangle, had been formalized in some way by the Greeks, who brought in completely new idea of proofs and propositions and theorems and so forth. <coughs> um, but Descartes saw another way of doing it, and others, I have to say, at the same time, some people think Harriet himself was responsible for uh, some of the progress here. But having done that, that then opened up a lot of other questions. The questions about curves, tangents of curves, areas bounded by curves, and so forth, geometrical problems to which this symbolic algebra could now be applied. And so here we have skipped to uh, Leibniz, 1684, and the calculus. So the heading is something about a new method for maxima and minima and tangents, etc., etc., etc. And what Leibniz is giving us here is actually very similar to the sort of textbook how to add up fractions. Um, here he's telling us how to find the differential, the derivative of a fraction. And if we look at the bottom corner there, you can see um, what is the rule for differentiating. It is v over y. The printers, of course, had endless trouble with this symbolic algebra stuff, bad enough having to do numbers, but having to do symbolic algebra and lay things out was quite beyond them at this time. But nevertheless, you can probably recognize that the rule is that in order to find the derivative of v over y, you 
find uh, you take v and you multiply it by the derivative of y and you add uh, y dv and then you divide the result by y squared. Again, this is a rule, an algorithm. He's not giving us any proof or explanation of why it's done. That is the answer. So, if we mention Leibniz, we must, of course, admit that he wasn't actually the first to do this. Uh, Newton had done it uh, at least 15 years beforehand. Uh, but <coughs> um, uh, quite a different talk would explain to you the difficulties of trying to work out what Newton had done and what he did with it and why. So I'm just going to uh, skip on and say that, well, uh, Newton had done a similar thing with symbolic algebra, which Newton absolutely loved in the uh, 1660s. Uh, his manuscripts are full of symbolic algebra. This was before he backed away from that and went back to classical mathematics as he understood it and wrote his Principia almost without using any symbolic algebra at all, using the old-fashioned uh, geometry of the ancients, because Newton believed that that was the way mathematics ought to be done. So, um, we ought, however, remember in my title, um, mention, most people know, that, that Newton was uh, employed at the Mint. He was both master and warden at various periods. Um, and people think this was just a, a sinecure, but it wasn't. Uh, Newton spent an awful lot of time on calculations involving money. And these are calculations of the kind that we've already had a glimpse of. Here he's talking about the French gold coin of the time, the Louis d'Or, and its valuation. So here we have a money object for the economists and a money of account, because in accounting terms in France, it was accounted for at whatever it says, 14 livres. And then there was a silver coin, and that was the écu of the time, uh, and that was accounted for at so many such and such. And <coughs> there is therefore some equivalence between the French gold and the French silver. And Newton was at pains to work that out. In order to do that, he had to know, not just do the arithmetic, he had to deal with this question of the assay, the fineness of it as well. And you'll see a little bit lower down, uh, something is worth such and such, as I have found it in some assays. Now, just hold on to the thought for the moment that here is something going on between gold coins and silver coins. And this is just in France. Uh, when the coins came over to England, as lots of them did, for various reasons. There were other problems as well because we had our gold and silver coins and we had to, in some way to reconcile the way the values of these coins with the English, between the English and the French. So uh, most people of course couldn't make any sense of this at all. So um, I'm tempted to show you this, I have shown you this. <coughs> most people used an analog calculator in other words, uh, a set of scales uh, and some weights, which were good enough for certain things. They could check that your coins, uh, here you can see there are four weights there, which are for the French Louis d'Or, which was called a pistole in England, and the half coin of that, and for the English guinea and the half guinea. And so you, anybody who dealt with gold coins carried these things around with them, and check that at least the things were roughly up to scratch uh, by weighing the coins as they came along. And they had tables to help them with the valuation. Right, so let us move on to the present day. Not quite. Oh, right. Before we moved on, I think I'll just skip very quickly over this. Uh, we have seen a little evidence enough evidence already <coughs> to make us believe that the units that were used for these calculations were absolutely horrid uh, and uh, anybody could be um, uh, forgiven 
for absolutely hating the subject of weights and measures. I hated it when I was at school because it was all strange units uh, in higgledy-piggledy uh, denominations. So many things made so many, but then a different number made the next unit and so on. So uh, for the sake of um, completeness, I will just say that towards the end of the 18th century and relating to all the upheavals were going on in France, the revolution and so forth, uh, the, the uh, metric system uh, was introduced. And this is the first um, official instruction for the metric system. As you will see, it is based on the decimal calculus and <coughs> the unit, the meter, was intended to be based on uh, a completely arbitrary but nevertheless totally international uh, measurement and it was supposed to be a definite part of the Earth's meridian. In order to do this they went to great lengths to survey part of the Earth's meridian and here is part of that survey. This is apparently near Carcassonne and you'll see it's based on the geometry that goes back to the Babylonians uh, although not measuring the areas of the triangles, but of course the angles of the triangles. You have a baseline, and if you know the angles uh, exactly, then you can do all complicated calculations and you can work out the length of the straight line. Uh, I must just point out that this turned out to be uh, rather futile, actually. Uh, although the metric system, great system, and we still use it, this particular definition of the meter is, of course, not valid because the Earth does not have uh, a meridian of constant length, the length of the meridian varies, and in any case it was incredibly difficult to do that measurement accurately. So we'll pass on to the present day and two global problems, <coughs> possibly only one global problem given uh, how the time is going. <coughs> One problem we've seen repeatedly is that when there are lots of different forms of money, then there are problems. <coughs> and I'm going to illustrate this specifically by going back to the 1870s because they had two specific forms of money then. That this particular problem is not the one that I'm leading up to but illustrates the basic idea rather clearly. So if you were living in Britain in the 1670s, you would be familiar, sorry, in the 1870s, uh, <coughs> you would be familiar with uh, gold sovereigns and silver shillings. And you would have been taught from an early day, time at school that 20 of these silver shillings made a, gold, made a sovereign, a pound. Uh, <coughs> and so this was an equation established by law. Of course, the government had to make sure that the sovereign and the shilling were uniform. If some of them were heavier than others and so forth, there'd be all kinds of weird things you could do uh, to defeat the system. So it was prescribed that the sovereign should weigh a certain amount. Uh, and I put it in grams there for the sake of comparison. That wasn't how it would it was expressed. It was expressed in the old troy weight system of uh, ounces, penny weights, grains, and so forth. Uh, and the other thing about the sovereign, you have to be sure how much gold, pure gold, was in it. Uh, and this again was fixed at 22 carats, a strange way of measuring the fineness, which but 24 carats was supposed to be pure, so this is 22 out of 24, which in percentages is 91.6 recurring. The shilling had to weigh a certain amount as well, and that had to have a certain fineness, a certain amount of pure silver in it, and that was expressed in another way, just to make things complicated. That had to be 11 ounces and 2 pennyweights of pure silver in 12 pennyweights, or one troy pound of alloy. So this gives us an equation that we can work out between pure gold and pure silver. And this was fundamental to the monetary system in this country, this ratio. 
<coughs> it comes out to be that. The numbers aren't important, and the gram is not important here because it could be any unit. One unit, whatever the unit was of pure gold, would be equal to that number of grams of pure silver. So it is just a dimensionless fraction there. <coughs> but sadly, not all countries adopted the same ratio. Here is a, a fictitious country um, to make the, uh, what's going on appear more straightforward. Uh, Utopia, run by RT types, of course, who thought, oh, well, we'll make the numbers come out nicely. We'll say one gram of pure gold in our coinage is going to be 20 grams of pure silver. <coughs> well, that's, that, that makes some calculations easier. But on the other hand, it's not hard to see that there are some problems associated with this situation, given that we now live in a world, or in the 1870s we lived in a world where international trade was very much the thing, international trade all around the world. And so there were lots and lots of utopias all around the world, all with their different numbers for their ratio between their gold and their silver. And the key fact, of course, when you have this discrepancy is that arbitrage, as it is technically known, can happen. So what is arbitrage? Well, uh, it's clear what the um, system would be. You have your gram of pure gold in Britain. You send it to Utopia and exchange it for 20 grams of uh, uh, pure silver, and then you take the silver back to Britain, and then you only need 14 of those, 14 point so many of those grams, and you can buy another, gray, another gram of pure gold and, and keep the profit to yourself. And you can keep on doing this and thereby, of course, make uh, unlimited profits. So all the <coughs> countries of the world were always fiddling about with their ratio to try and keep it in line. And if they didn't do it properly, then gold or silver, whichever, would flow into or out of the country and there would be all kinds of problems with the domestic currency. Let's move on to the present day, or near the present day, by <coughs> where this idea rears its head again. By the middle of the 20th century, well, of course, everybody shares had been around for a long time. Isaac Newton um, had invested in shares, and he'd made quite a lot of money out of some of them, but he'd also lost a lot of money, something called the South Sea Bubble. <coughs> there was something called the South Sea Company, uh, which was set up to trade in the, in the South Seas, and it became very popular, uh, but, uh, and lots of people invested in it because it offered uh, great rewards. This was a new field of commerce, a, a new area of enterprise. Uh, but unfortunately, the South Sea Company found better things to do with their money than actually doing any commerce in the South Seas. They did things like lending it to the government, for example, uh, and also, of course, telling other people that it was really a very good idea to invest in the shares of the South Sea Company. So there was a South Sea bubble, and it crashed, and Newton lost a lot of money. The relevant thing for us, perhaps, is what he, he's recorded as saying. He said, well, for all my expertise in calculation and these monetary matters, and he was doing this daily at the Mint, I cannot cope with the madness of the people. And that I'd like you to bear in mind for a few minutes. So, uh, by the time, the middle of the 20th century, there was a lot of trade in the markets, not in shares themselves, stocks, but options on shares. So quickly, this is what the simplest form of op option is. Um, suppose we have a share, it's got a price at a certain time. An option allows me to buy the share at some future time, call it big T, for a fixed amount. I don't know what the actual price is going to be, but when the time big T comes along, if the actual price is bigger 
and the E, the exercise price as it's called, I shall buy the share, and if it's not, I won't. So there are lots and lots of variations on this, but that is the simplest form of option. Problem was that nobody really knew how to price these options. What should I pay for an option? Obviously, the price should depend upon certain of these things, the time or the difference between the little time, little t now, and the time, big t, when the option is going to be exercised, the amount <coughs> uh, uh, per share, the big E, the exercise price, and most importantly, the price of the share, the underlying share, today. And it wasn't until 1973 that people worked out a mathematical way of doing this. And the underlying key was this arbitrage idea, or better still, the fact that you should not be able to exercise arbitrage. Here again, we have two different forms of money, the share and the option on the share. And what Black and Scholes did, and I should just mention <coughs> uh, that uh, Robert Merton, another person, did much the same thing around much the same time. Uh, what, what they said was, um, in their <coughs> financial terms, if options are correctly priced in the market, it should not be possible to make sure profits, <coughs> excuse me, that's arbitrage, by creating portfolios of long and short positions. That means buying and selling in our terms. <coughs> Long and short positions in the options and their underlying stocks. <coughs> Using this principle, a theoretical formula is obtained. And the formula, <coughs> though it was written in symbolic algebra, calculus, probability theory, all come into it, <coughs> it is basically an algorithm. It is a rule which <coughs> enables uh, somebody who perhaps does not understand exactly what is going on, as with the fractions and as with the differentiating the, uh, the quotient, um, <coughs> a, a rule that enables somebody to say, well, this is what mathematics says the price of the option is, and this is how I can work it out. And that was what actually happened. The problem was, of course, that in order to obtain this formula, you have to have some assumptions <coughs> about how the share price, the underlying share price, is evolving. Now, that had been around for a little while, going back to the beginning of the 20th century, the name of Bachelier is the most <coughs> associated with that. And uh, again, if you want to read more about this, there is a, it is in the transcript. Um, <clears throat> based on assumptions which would seem reasonable, which were fed into the Black-Scholes formula, you could obtain this result. <clears throat> but of course, uh, as we know, um, things went wrong. <clears throat> and things went wrong for the reason that Newton had picked on several hundred years before, you can do these calculations, but you cannot predict the madness of the people. If you're going to introduce the normal distribution, shall we say, that's a form of statistical distribution <coughs> which comes into this calculation. If you're going to introduce that and say that is the way certain things are distributed, then you're making an assumption and that assumption may well not be valid. The normal distribution is a valid way of estimating quite a lot of things, and there are some mathematical theorems which tell you why it's actually quite reasonable to do that, but it's by no means a universal rule. So um, I think where we've got to now, <coughs> my best plan is to just very briefly tell you what the second global problem was going to be, 
uh, and then uh, stop and uh, allow you to read that in the transcript afterwards. Second global problem has similarities to what I've just been talking about, and that is because <coughs> it is the case where mathematics is now deployed in a very important area of our daily lives, but where we are not completely sure that we've actually got the mathematics right. So that picture <coughs> is just explaining that an awful lot of our transactions now, I read yesterday that less than 50% of commercial uh, <coughs> uh, trade, sort of high street transactions are now done with cash. A lot of them are done with plastic cards. And when you pay by a plastic card, of course, what you're actually doing is <coughs> changing the information which is held in your bank's computer and the uh, bank of the computer from whom you're buying. So the goods come from the shop to you, and then the money, in quotes, goes round the other way. But the money, in this case, is now just numbers held in various computers. And that has to be kept safe. We all want our transactions to be kept safe. And brings us to the story of cryptography, which I'm not going to have time to talk to you about. Um, a breakthrough in the 1970s introduced a new method of cryptography called public key cryptography, which is now essential to keeping these transactions safe. And <coughs> it involves not simply the old methods of cryptography, whereby you had one key which encoded or encrypted the information and the same key decrypted it, but two keys. So here is A trying to <coughs> communicate with B, and B has both a public key and a private key. And they are used in the way which is now going to flash past very, very quickly, <coughs> because <coughs> that is A using B's public key to send a message and B decrypting it. Here is Dr. Evil, who is trying to intercept this message, and he has access to both B's public key and the message, which is that hash symbol going across there. That's the encrypted message. And the beauty of the system is that with that information, although he has a key for B, it's only the public key, and although he has the message, he cannot actually do the calculation which will retrieve what the message said, which will tell him what I have paid my bank, or what my bank has paid the shop's bank, etc. <coughs> the calculation that Dr. Evil has to do is a hard calculation. Or is it? Well, sadly, um, we can't be sure. We can't be sure mathematically, because the mathematical theorem, which it is believed would actually encapsulate this result, has not been proved. And even if it were, it's not entirely clear that that would answer the practical question, because the history of cryptography is full of people thinking they had got foolproof systems, only to discover that some clever person comes along and thinks of a different way of doing the, uh, the, the question, answering the question, and so the system is shattered. Well, um, given, as I am told, uh, the custom is to have a short time for questions, I think I have to stop there. Thank you. <laughs>